what you're going to see tonight is something that should be able to bring all of us together. Because we're not going to point out to some bad guy. You're going to see some pretty awful things that are taking place here. And you're going to want to blame somebody. You're going to say, well, he did it, or she did it, or they did it. Very often the people that are involved in what's going on, what you're about to see, have no idea that they're even involved. And they're doing it just in the name of trying to do a good job. So we're going to show you that, show you how it works out. We're going to start with a program called False Choices. How Agenda 21 is transforming your community. Now this woman you see here, Betty Perry, was arrested in 2007 in uh, Orem, Utah. I don't know if you can notice it up there, she's got this little mark on her nose. And that's where the handcuffs hit her when she was taken away in a police car, uh, in a place in a holding tank. Now the reason she was arrested was because her front lawn was, quote, dying. <coughs> she didn't realize that that was an offense that could result in her going off to jail. In the earlier part of this year, 2011, Julie Bass was planting an organic garden in her front yard. Simple thing to do. Julie likes organic foods for her family. So uh, they became quite expensive, so she decided, gee, I'll just start a little garden for myself. Seems interesting and innocent enough. However, she checked with the mayor first to be sure that was okay in their town. And the mayor said, well, that's fine. You can go ahead and plant a garden. We don't have a problem with that at all. She went to the town council, and they said, we don't care. That's fine. Plant your garden. Next thing you know, an enforcement code officer pulls up, and she's being hauled away and now faces 93 days in jail. What happened? The technology officer, officer from town came in and said, that's not allowed under these new uh, uh, zoning ordinances that we've established through our uh, master plan. And therefore, you now face uh, charges. She's now fighting those criminal charges. In Dade County, uh, Florida, 1,500 people are losing their homes. And we're going to see why they're losing them and why they're having such difficulty in getting those back. And over here, 17,000 people in King County, Washington, have petitioned the county courthouse to try to win back their land rights because they've lost 65% of their land. So we're going to discuss just how can these crazy things happen. I mean, this is America, and, and this stuff doesn't happen here, right? Well. In order to get into this whole scheme of understanding why this is going on and, and how it may or may not affect you, we have to understand the value of property rights. Without property rights, we don't have freedom, we don't have liberty. They are unalienable, they are not lienable, you can't place liens against those, that was the meaning of the word. But it also means it cannot be severed. Property rights cannot be taken away from us, and our founding fathers made a, a specific point of that. They even went to the Constitution, and the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution said, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall our private property be taken for the public use without just compensation. So why all this emphasis on property? Well, it's real simple. We talk about rights all the time, but as, after a while we begin to take those rights for granted, and we forget just what they actually mean to us. So let me put property rights in perspective. You and I and everyone else in this room are organic living beings. We need certain things in order to survive. We need food, we need land, we need a roof over our head. We have to at least have the ability to have that completely within our control and nobody with the ability to take it away from you. If you don't have that ability, then you're either a serf or you're on your way there. You have to at least have the opportunity to live in a nation where, you know what, I can own this and it's mine and nobody can ever get it away from me. That's why our founding fathers found property rights so very important. It's something that you were given the authority, the ability, through the Constitution to own, and no one could ever take it away from you. Now that's the way we work in the United States of America. But not all countries work that way. So what I'd like to introduce you to is the United Nations Agenda 21. We're going to learn all about this tonight. It also goes by another name, Sustainable Development. You'll find that these two terms are used interchangeably. So we're going to trace the very history of it. So to understand the documents, you have to understand the people who put those documents together. So two people are, are primarily responsible for this. In 1980, uh, 1986, the United Nations requested a report be done. Actually, 1982, they requested the report. It was finally completed in 87. They requested a report that said, what can we do to protect our planet against things like global warming, against the misuse of our, our uh, natural resources, uh, and also to eliminate poverty. So they asked Gro Brundtland if she would head up a commission and write this report. So you have to understand, let's understand a little bit about Gro Brundtland. Gro Brundtland was the uh, primary minister of Norway three times in a row. She's a popular gal. Gro is also the vice president of the World Socialist Party. 
Now, since most of the world is socialist anyway, that's not so hard to believe. That makes sense. But what we might understand is what Gro believes. If you go on to the website of the World Socialist Party here in the United States, our chapter of it, here's what it says. The World Socialist Party of the United States is part of a globalist socialist movement that believes capitalism cannot meet the needs of the majority of people in the world, however progressive it might become. To meet these needs, capitalism must be replaced by socialism. Now, there's nothing wrong with this if that's what you believe in, but you, you need to understand. If you're going to understand where Agenda 21 came from and how this whole piece came to be put together, you need to understand the people who wrote the documents that created it. This gal thinks we need to get rid of capitalism, so that's one of her main objectives. We also have another gentleman I'd like to introduce you to, named Maurice Strong. Now, Maurice uh, is kind of an interesting guy. He was the former director of the uh, UN Environmental Program. He's also the chairman of the World Wildlife Foundation. Now, Maurice, Maurice is a cool guy to get to know. Maurice, by the time he was 25 years old, was the president of Dome Petroleum in Canada. So he was already doing fairly well for himself. He also purchased 200,000 acres of land over the largest freshwater aquifer in the United States, <coughs> along with Adnan Khashoggi. We all remember who Adnan Khashoggi is? Yeah. Everybody heard? He was the arms dealer that got in trouble a whole bunch of years back. But he was, he was in the newspaper, I guess, probably in the 80s. He was in there most of the time. So these two got together, bought the land up, and the idea was, what we'll do is we'll just, uh, we'll just barricade the water and then release it to the southwestern United States, and we'll make a fortune for ourselves. We'll control all the water flow to all these farmers down in the new water. So it's like a real cool way to make money. Except the environmental groups got, the local environmental groups came in and they said, well, wait a minute, you can't do this. So they stopped them and they made them all pull out of there and they paid them a few million dollars to get lost. And he wasn't really very environmentally friendly. So for some bizarre reason, this guy who just got chased out by environmental groups suddenly was called upon in 1979 to become the director of the UN Environmental Program. Why? Well, I don't know. Sometimes maybe it's, maybe it's who you know and not what, what it is that you do. As the director of the UN Environmental Program, he had a mission. And I want you to listen to this mission because you're going to hear this pop up again and again and again. We're back in 1979 now. To provide new leadership and encourage partnership in caring for the environment by inspiring, informing, and enabling nations and peoples to uh, improve their quality of life without compromising that of future generations. It all sounds like good stuff. I want to take care of today, have a good quality of life, and I don't want to compromise the future generations. Sound good? Absolutely. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I'm all on board with that. So we have two players here. One was a socialist who said, I need to destroy the capitalist system. The other, who made a fortune in the capitalist system, but then moved onward and decided the environmental program was, was a better way. Not exactly on the up and up all the time, dealing with arms traders, doing shady deals with land and so on, and also the head of an oil company. So um, some of the things he did were not completely on the up and up. If you try to track Maurice down today, you can probably find him because he lives in China. Anybody remember the oil for food program? Mm -hmm. And the scandal that followed that? Yeah. That was Maurice. <laughs> he was in the middle of it. So we're having a little bit of trouble tracking Maurice down these days. <laughs> but these are the players. These are the two guys who are mostly responsible for this. A book called Our Common Future. By 1987, that book was completed. And it outlined exactly what sustainable development would look like. In fact, there's the report. I don't want you to, by the way, let me preface this. I don't want you to take my word for anything when I say this evening. Everything is documented, everything's provable. Amazon.com, you can buy this book for, I don't remember, 15, 20 bucks, you can buy the book. And if you go to chapter, chapter two in here, it will define what sustainable development is. It is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sound familiar? I know I just heard that just a moment ago. Yeah, that was Maurice back in 1979 at the United Nations. So that kind of, you know, worked its way right in here in this book in chapter 2 called uh, Towards a Sustainable Development. Now, what, what this book does is it defines what mankind throughout the world, this isn't just the United States, this is every nation on earth, what mankind has to do in order to protect the planet from this new thing that was just starting, this whole global warming thing, what about then that was starting to gain popularity. Uh, to protect the planet from climate change and protect the planet from being destroyed by man. That's what this report did. So in there they said, this is what we need to do. And all this sounds good until you read the report. Because inside the report it says that poverty is a major cause and effect of global environmental problems. Well, that's kind of interesting because what I just did is I took an environmental problem and I related it to a poverty problem. 
So I now combine the two. The report goes on to say that certain nations are destroying this earth more so than other. So that what we need to do is we need to take the resources from those nations that are destroying the earth and we need to transfer those to other parts of the world. So the developing nations need to take the money from the wealthier nations. And in doing so, that's going to protect the environment. Now, when you start taking wealth and redistributing, remember the president said, well, we need to spread wealth around a little bit? You probably thought what he was referring to was, you know, from a guy who's making 300000 a year down to a guy who's making $30,000 a year. That wasn't exactly what the whole story was. There's a larger scheme here, and that larger scheme says that we must transfer wealth out of the United States of America and more prosperous nations and into less prosperous nations if, in fact, we expect the planet to survive. Now, thank God these were just two guys, you know, sitting in a room in the cellar of the United Nations writing this report out. Because how many people in here have ever read a United Nations report? Right, nobody reads these things anyway. So, okay, right now it's just a cockamamie idea. We're going to take the money out of America, transfer it somewhere else, and somehow that's going to save the planet. Okay, fine. It's nothing but a report. So we can all take a sigh of relief, breathe, and this whole thing's not going to bother us at all. Except for one little thing. They said what we need to have is an Earth sum. So they did. Five years later, in 1992, in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, they had the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. That was called Agenda 21. That's where the name comes from. It's an agenda for the 21st century. And it was no longer two people in the basement of the United Nations in New York. All of a sudden, it was 18,000 people who showed up. And at this meeting, they codified what Agenda 21 was going to look like. So while this book talked about sustainable development, okay, there we go, I knew it was there. It was buried in the basement of the UN. <laughs> this book codified the report here. So we now have an action plan. Everybody in here heard the word Agenda 21? Have you heard it? You heard the name? Okay, this is it. This is Agenda 21. It's not a fantasy. It's not some tinfoil hat scheme. This is Agenda 21. And if you want to buy it, you can go on the United Nations website. You can go to Google, hit the United Nations, Agenda 21, and then you can go purchase it. Or you can download it for free on some different websites also. But this now says what the world must look like and how we can roll it out and make that happen. In short, this is a high-level action plan. You have action, you, there's business people in here. So we have action plans to make things work, right? So that's what this is. This is an action plan. Well, okay, so we have a meeting. And uh, Maurice Strong just so happens, remember Maurice, he was the guy that was trying to tie up all the water, fresh water, running a guy that's hiding out in China right now from the Royal for Fruit Scandal? Okay, well Maurice is back, it's 1992, and now he's at the Earth Summit in Rio, and he walks out on stage, just like I did a few moments ago. He had a few more people there. And instead of saying, well, am I wired up, can you guys hear me? He said something a little different. These were his opening remarks. Current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, the use of fossil fuels, electrical appliances, home and workplace air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. Remember we said it was towards a sustainable community, towards sustainability? Well, now we're deciding what's no longer sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, that means we must begin to eliminate it. He also said, is it the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse. Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Mm -hmm. That was Marie Strong in his role as founder of the United, the United Nations Environmental Program. Again, understand the people you're dealing with and then you can understand the outcomes. There are no outcomes, there's only people. They drive them and make them happen. So this is Marie's. Well, the meeting was over. Actually, the meeting was being designed. The Convention on Biological Diversity was part of the folks that got together to actually draw up this booklet that you see right here. They were part of one portion of the authors of this booklet. And they decided that, okay, that's pretty good, that's all right, that gives us a lot of information. But what we really need to do is we need something that's a practical tool for translating the principles of Agenda 21 into reality. So we need to make all this stuff at meetings into reality that's going to go somewhere. You know, booklets are fine, we need to do something with it. Well, if you're going to take over the whole world, I guess you need a little more 
something a little bigger. So they got it. They created the Global Biodiversity Assessment, and that's what this guy is. And, and this Global Biodiversity Assessment chunks down the action plan that's in this book, in 40 chapters in this book, and it breaks it into a worldwide program and says what each nation is going to have to look like if we're going to actually save the planet. So in here it defines, and by the way, you can buy this. I got this from Cambridge University. Uh, there's only a few copies left, of but they're floating around. You can get a hold of these things. When, so, so in here they define not only what the Earth has to look like when we get done, it's going to define what America's going to look like. And I'm going to show you what this book says America's going to look like. Now, thank heavens, this is still a UN book, right? So we don't have to worry. This, this is still at the UN. Yeah, that's all right. So we're in America. You know, and nothing can happen here, so we're okay. So, so here we are. This is the book. But let's take a look inside this book. Because in here it tells you what's not sustainable. So if it's not sustainable, what has to happen to it? It's got to go. It's got to go. It's got to be limited or, or eliminated. Limited or eliminated if it's not sustainable according to this book. Well, here's what's in this book. Unsustainable activities. Do you like to ski? Well, skiing is considered unsustainable. Do you like little fish ponds in your backyard? Where you got koi and all these little guys floating around and you go out and watch them each day? Well, you're not going to be able to do that if the folks who wrote this book got their way. But they're not going to get their way because this is American. This stuff doesn't happen here. So that book. Pastures where you can graze your horses. Do you like golfing? Maybe you like running golf. Well, golf courses are considered unsustainable. Asphalt, macadam, roadways, concrete are considered unsustainable. Therefore, what we have to do is begin to find ways to get rid of them. Gee, one way we put a bicycle pathway instead of putting four lanes out there, just have three, or instead of six lanes, we bring it back down to four, and just have maybe some open spaces and things around there so we don't have to have quite so much macadam out there. Unsustainable human activities are dams. You're going to start noticing dams are beginning to disappear in America. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but just check the news and start to see what's going on. For one reason or another, they're going to start going down because they're unsustainable. Bends in rivers that are human-made, that are been straightened, I'm sorry, where there was a bend and man straightened it, that is unsustainable because it's not natural. The scales of justice in the United States of America are unsustainable. All of this comes from this book. Why are the scales of justice in America unsustainable? Sounds like we've got one of, the, one of the hottest legal systems going. Well, it's real simple, because animals and plants and the earth have rights. Therefore, they need to have representation and they need to be able to sue us. And they're not able to do that quite as readily as some people would like to see. So, all I can say is that Kevin's this is just a book. Basically, the way, just, the way this works is that if, if I was a kid when I was nine, and, and I was in love with Amy, and so in the backyard, I had a big oak tree, so I put one of those cardinals initials in there. It says, John loves Amy. I don't know how Amy felt about this, but anyway, John put it on the tree in the back. Well, all of a sudden, I've disfigured that tree. I've, I've harmed that tree. So it should have some kind of rights to be able to come back and say, well, John, you don't get to do that, so we're going to sue you, you know, and maybe Amy along with it. I don't know. I might her the lawsuit. So that's unsustainable. Private property is unsustainable. Americans have too much private property, and the majority of our wealth is tied up in private property. Therefore, one thing we need to do to return the Earth to its natural state is to begin to reduce the amount of private property that's held throughout the, throughout the world, not just the United States, but throughout the world. Consumerism is unsustainable. Why in the world is consumerism unsustainable? Well, if I buy stuff, somebody has to make stuff. And if somebody makes that stuff, then they're running machines, and they're using up natural resources to make it. So therefore, the less I buy, the safer the planet's going to be. Again, all in global biodiversity assessment. And the family unit is unsustainable because we're suffering from overpopulation. You're going to find that when people come into your area, particularly planners, and they, they come up with this grand scheme as to what they're going to do, very often one of the reasons they come in is because overpopulation. Oh, the population has exploded now. Sometimes the population is exploding, and sometimes you do need to do something about that. So you have to understand that. Here's the problem with what my talk tonight. I'm not going to give you a clear yes or no. I'm just going to show you what's going on out there, and you have to really make distinctions. That's a lot of what this is about, being able to make distinctions. When is it right, and when is it not so good for you? So we need to be able to, to look at that clearly. But according to that book, we can only support about 1 billion people on the planet. Right now, there's 7 billion. We're headed for 15 billion. How they're going to shrink that back down, I don't even want to think about. But anyway, there's too many people out there. 
So therefore, we can't just have these burgeoning family units the way they are. We need to take precautions to see that the family unit remains small. And most of all, we have what we call the wildlife, wildlands program. Now, the wildlands program is what the United States will look like if this book is implemented. And so you know where this came from. It's on page 993, actually it's 993 or 933, I forget which one it is. It's on page 933 or 993 in here. It defines what the Wildlands Project is. And the intent of the Wildlands Project is to remove human beings from 50% of the United States. These black, these uh, red zones that you see up in here, right there, are no human habitation is allowed on those areas. The yellow zones around those are buffer zones. You'll be able to use those zones uh, basically as protectionary and precautionary to see that nothing takes place inside these zones, which are fully at their uh, natural vegetative state. The only people allowed in the buffer zones will be members of the federal government, officers, code enforcement, and so on and so forth. Again, all outlined in this book. So where do you think we're going to live? If the wild animals and the wolves and everybody else is taking over the rest of it, where are we? Well, that's about it. We're over here in these little dots that you might see here. And you'll see little black dots over here and little black dots over here. And those are what we call high density habitats. So this book, and in conjunction with several different meetings of the United Nations, each over a five year period from Johannesburg, Germany, uh, right up to present day, have defined what it's going to take worldwide to get us to look like that. Now this map is kind of interesting because you say to yourself, well, okay, <laughs> this is America, you know, nothing like that could ever happen here. And thank God it was still only the United Nations book, right? So we're okay, we're safe, we're sound, this is a bunch of people from the UN, we'll never have to worry about it, let's just go back and, and live life the way we were living it, because it can't happen, well, well, maybe it can happen. In 1992, George H.W. Bush signed the agreement, a soft treaty in uh, uh, Rio, to implement Agenda 21, Sustainable Development in the United States. He agreed, by, became a signatory to what they call the Rio Declaration, which you all have a copy of. He, uh, I think if you have a little copy of this uh, sheet of paper that has the United Nations logo on the upper left-hand corner. He signed on to that and agreed to bring it to the United States. Now we're still safe, okay, we're okay, we don't have to worry about it, because a soft treaty has no teeth, so it means you can't enforce it, you can't do anything with it, so thank God, whew, maybe old George made a mistake, but we're still covered, except for one thing. In June of 1993, Bill Clinton came along and he signed Executive Order 12852, which created the President's Council on Sustainable Development to begin implementation in federal agencies. And that's called oops, this, Towards a Sustainable America. There are seven of these, and you can download them. Uh, I'll give you a website. You can go there and you can download them or you can order them from the U.S. Printing Office. These were done back in the early 90s. In here, he defines, the Council that on Sustainable Development defines exactly what sustainable development is going to look like in the United States of America. So let's just trace the breadcrumbs, like Hansel and Gretel did. We were going to make sure to get back home again. Let's understand, we had Gro and Maurice and a team of 12 other people put together a report for the UN saying how are we going to save the United States, and this came out back in 1987. This said we need to develop a sustainable world, not just America, not just America. That report was codified in the UN Agenda 21 in 1992. George Bush signed on to it and agreed to everything that's in this book, the Global Biodiversity Assessment. It didn't mean anything because it was a soft treaty and had no teeth, until Bill Clinton signed it into an executive order and established the President's Council on Sustainable Develop Development. It is now in the United States. It's here. It crossed the borders. We can no longer say this is just some scheme in the basement of the UN at the end of 42nd Street. Well, it didn't stop there because once Bill signed the order, everybody else got on board. By 1997, the U.S. Conference of Mayors had created the Joint Center for Sustainable Communities. And why wouldn't they? If I say sustainable development, I don't think bad things, I think good things. I think I want to, you know, recycle my garbage, I want to take care of my front lawn, I want to, you know, build a home that's, that's uh, respons built responsibly. What could possibly be wrong with sustainable development? And the answer is, there's nothing wrong with sustainable development. What's wrong is when you take a good idea and you co-opt it with a political agenda, 
That's what's wrong. So we need to make those distinctions. When do I really have sustainable development? And really do I have a political agenda that calls itself sustainable development? By 2001, the National Governors Association endorsed smart growth, advancing statewide sustainable development. And in 2011, Senator, uh, sorry, President Barack Obama signed Executive Order 13575 and created the White House Rural Communities Act, enabling implementation of sustainable development in 16% of the United States of America. Well, okay, it's still a bunch of executive orders, right? I mean, you know, how can you turn an executive order into something that's going to bother me in my own backyard? I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. And is this, is this really Agenda 21? Is, come on, I mean, this is, that nah, can't, can't possibly be. Well, actually, if you go into that book, which I just held up there, the President's Council on Sustainable Development is explicitly charged with recommending a national action plan on how to achieve a sustainable development in the U.S. The PCSD was conceived, and here it is, to formulate recommendations for the implementation of Agenda 21. So when somebody looks at you and they say, oh, you're nuts, we're not part of Agenda 21, I want you to go right to this website right here, or, or Google it. State Department submission to the fifth session of the Commission on Sustainable Development, or just State Department, fifth session, PCSD, that'll do it, April 1997. And you're going to find that the only reason the President's Council was formed was to implement Agenda 21. There was no other reason. Do they read? Do they what? Do they read? <laughs> they do read. Yeah, they read. Now, how did this get to our backyard? Because presidents control regulatory agencies. And regulatory agencies write what? Regulations. That's what they do for a living. They sit there and they write regulations. So now we just bypass Congress. There's nothing to vote on any longer. There's nothing that you're council has to, uh, the uh, congressman or your senator has anything to do with it, because we bypassed that whole process. When the president created an executive order, he now embedded it down in 11 of the federal agencies at that time. But he also embedded, it, partnered up with non-governmental organizations. And we'll, has everybody heard of non-governmental organizations? Do you know what they're NGOs? Okay, good. I'll, there's only one that seems really solid. We'll, we'll uh, give you a little bit more information on that. But groups like the APA here, the American Planning Association, uh, Institute for Sustainable <coughs> Communities, the public, uh, the, the Trust for Public Land, and so on. Uh, all of these principles that were put together in here and from this global biodiversity assessment, they now made their way down into these agencies. So when regulations are being drawn up by the EPA, when they're being drawn up by the Forest Service and so on, they're in compliance with the President's Council on Sustainable Development, because that's what agencies do. They're supposed to be in compliance with what the President says. He's the boss. He gets to tell them what they can do and what they're not allowed to do. So the motto of this whole Agenda 21 program is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Have you ever heard that before? Where did we hear that one before? Oh, Maurice. Oh, Maurice came out, came out with that, and all of a sudden now it's worked its way all the way up into the Agenda 21. And Agenda 21 consists of Three E's. These three E's, by the way, are defined in this book. Came right out of this book. So you can go in there and you can find where they are. First one is social equity. Social equity is when the individual gives up his personal wants for the needs of the community. We're going to tear into that a little bit more, take a closer look at it. Economic prosperity is part of the three E's. Free market is replaced by public-private partnerships, and there's an international transfers of wealth. We're going to talk about that a little, and then ecological integrity, where individual rights are subordinated to environmental needs. Mm -hmm. So what does all this mean to you and to you and I? Well, laws, well, under social equity, laws coerce individuals to give up their personal wants for the needs of the community. Or as Harvey Rubin there said, individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective in the process of implementing sustainable development. Harvey Rubin is a member of ICLEI. We'll hear a little more about ICLEI in just, uh, just a moment here. And get this, don't forget Harvey's picture here, because we're going to come back to Harvey again in just a minute, and you're going to meet him uh, a little bit closer. Individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective. What kind of talking is this? Is this, man, it's kind of weird. This is not American talking. This is not what we think of when we think of the United States of America and buying a little piece of property where I can, you know, have a little stream in the backyard and raise my kids and put a swing, a, a, a little swing set for my grandchildren. But all of a sudden, we've got a whole new language that's happening. And it's all in the name of this sustainable development. 
Economic prosperity, there's two components of economic prosperity according to our common future, according to uh, the Agenda 21 book, and according to the seven uh, pamphlets, seven uh, booklets that are put out by the President's Council on Sustainable Development. And a transfer of wealth simply means this. The developmental and, and uh, the developmental and environmental objectives of Agenda 21 will require a substantial flow of new and additional financial resources to developing nations. The Rio Declaration says equity will be achieved through implementation of the international economic order and through transfers of resources to developing countries. Do you get what I'm talking about here? We're going to save the planet. We're not going to save the planet by living responsibly. We're not going to save the planet by recycling. We're going to save the planet by creating a whole new social structure among the people who live there. Now, this would be wacky if it was nothing but a report written in the basement of the United Nations in, in 1987. But that's not what it is anymore. Now it's here in the United States of America. So when we talk about this Agenda 21 preamble, you're going to find that here in the pamphlet that I, uh, paper that I just handed out, which is the front pages of this book. That's where it came from. I want you to know where every bit of this comes from, because I don't want you to ever not be able to hold your head up high in any company and say, that's what this is. Because you're going to meet people who have no idea. They're up to their eyeballs in Agenda 21, and they don't know it. And they honestly, genuinely, sincerely have no idea what it is that's going on. So in that case, you need to educate. But we're going to, we're going to look at a couple of these principles in just a minute. These are the principles that drive this entire system. That's called the Rio Declaration. Remember, this is what George Bush signed off on. What are public-private partnerships? Well, public-private partnerships are kind of neat. Because if you're, let's say, a benefit corporation, or if you're a corporation that works in conjunction with the government, you get certain tax breaks. You get certain limited liabilities. For instance, in California, there are housing units that are going up. And most people, I know the builders in, in, in this room right now, they're responsible, and they know if I, if I build a structure, I build it well, because I know that at the end of the day, I'm responsible, and they're going to come back to me. Besides, I'm a good businessman. I want to be able to build more businesses. I want, to, I, want to, I want people to come back to me. So we do a good job to take care of our customers. But some of these agreements, not all of them, some of these agreements say, you know what? The builder has no liability. So if the roof's fallen in, or this is caving in, or the sheetrock wasn't done properly, or whatever, they have absolutely no liability. They're forgiven. And that's beginning to happen in different sustainable communities across the United States. And again, I use the word distinction. It's not happening everywhere. There's really honest builders out there who want to do a good job to give the community what they want. So we need to be able to separate the two. The problem with public-private partnerships is this. The guy who's on the outside has a rough time with it. If you're not part of the PPP, then you're part of the free enterprise system. All of a sudden, you're faced paying the high taxes, you have the normal liabilities, you have limited access to those federal dollars, you have high competition, high cost of getting a hold of cash and money, and you often run into a struggle to survive. Ultimately, PTPs, if they grow large enough, they begin to drive out that middle-class businessman that's so, so, so essential to the in the United States of America. That's one of the pieces that, that I'm here for. I'm one of those three enterprise guys in the middle who runs a small business. So I begin to see around me how these things, how these things happen. Uh, and we have ecological integrity. That was the third E. This is where individual rights are subordinated to nature. It's nature over man. In the Rio Declaration, Human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They're entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. Now, this is principle number one. I want you to look at this from a couple of standpoints. First of all, viewpoints. We're going to tear that sentence apart because I want you to understand what that thing says and the impact of that sentence. This came from this book, Agenda 21. This is the Bible of, of this whole movement that we've described right now through President, uh, uh, our current president, actually. But if you'll take out this little sheet of paper, if you have it on your uh, chair there, it's got the UN logo in the upper left hand corner. But it's not blue. It's not blue. No, sir. I'm so sorry. We copied it in black and white. If you go down to principle number one, and we'll read it right off the paper, and this should be exactly what's up there. Human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. So all of a sudden, sustainable development is human, a human issue. It's no longer a climactic issue. It's no longer a planetary thing. It's no longer the planet comes and goes, the species come and go. That's not even part of the equation anymore. We're at the center of this problem. 
So the, per the fact that the planet's not sustaining the way it needs to be, according to certain people's equations, it's our fault. That's number one. But number two, they, meaning us, are entitled to a healthy, productive life. Let me stop you right there. Who in the world gets to tell me what kind of life I'm entitled to? Anybody? I get to decide what kind of a life I'm entitled to. I do the best I can, do the best job, to be fair to the people around me, to try to be a, a good and decent human being, and, and live a lifestyle that's a decent one. But all of a sudden, we have someone telling us what we're entitled to or not. And then the last part of that sentence, they're entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. So in other words, I don't even get that healthy and productive life if I'm not in harmony with nature. Now this sounds completely bizarre to most of us sitting in this room because we have a thing called the Declaration of Independence where we don't get our rights from any particular person. They come from a higher being, if that's what you believe in, or whatever power source you, that may be yours. But we don't get that from someone else. However, remember, this all was initiated from a report to the United Nations, and the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is a list of what you can and can't do. That's how it works. And it only makes sense that if you're going to put together a worldwide document, which is what this is, this is not just meant for us here in the U.S., if you're going to put together a worldwide document, why not use the U.N. Declaration of Human Rights because it's already a worldwide organization. So that's why you see the terminology in here that you do. The problem with it is it's in direct opposition to what we as Americans see, feel, live, breathe, well, all the things we've been brought up to believe in. It goes on to say that to achieve sustainable development, states, and all the United States is to the, to the UN, just another state, neither we get capitalized. But other than that, that's all we are. States should reduce and eliminate unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. And we already know what the unsustainable patterns of production and consumption are because they're all outlined here in this report. And they didn't put this report together just to have a report sit in the basement of the United Nations and nobody will look at it. Now, a lot of people never heard of Agenda 21. A lot of people never heard of the things that I'm talking about. Now I'm going to tell you why you haven't heard about it. I'm sure many people in this room heard Agenda 21 and they said, uh, not so sure about that. Well, it's no accident. One of President Clinton's advisors was a gentleman named J. Gary Lawrence. He was an advisor to the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Today, he's the urban strategist leader with Bayrock Consulting. If you're in the consulting field, planning, they're probably one of the biggest in the world. They're huge. They built the uh, uh, Sydney Opera House. They built the Tappan Zee Bridge. I mean, these guys are major, serious players. But they're also up to their necks in this thing called Agenda 21 and Smart Growth. So here's what J. Gary, J. Gary Lawrence wrote in a document uh, at the bottom of here, I don't want you to take more of it. The future of Agenda 21 in the new millennium, Google that, and you can download this document. If you can't find it, email me and I'll send it to you. Here's what he said. Participating in a United Nations advocated planning process would very likely bring out many who would actively work to defeat any elected official undertaking local Agenda 21. Therefore, we will call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth, why? Because these are terms that we're all familiar with, we all feel safe with, we all feel comfortable with. They're things that, that builders and contractors and homeowners have used on a day-to-day -day basis for 20 years or more. And they're fine, they're safe. So why not hide behind that? And that's what they did. All of a sudden they came out with groups of terms like smart growth, smart streets, visioning processes, consensus, open spaces, walkable communities, sustainable New York, sustainable Pennsylvania, sustainable New Jersey and on and on and on and on. Multi-use dwelling, mixed-use dwellings. I was talking to a gentleman earlier today who does a fine job, I'm sure, of mixed-use dwellings in an honorable way, and you should only be doing business with this gentleman. The reality is, though, people have co-opted this stuff, and here's why. We need to turn this, which is now considered urban sprawl. Remember it used to be suburban, suburbia? We all wanted to have maybe a little half acre, or a quarter of an acre, or maybe two or three acres if you were zoned that way or something. We always want to have our little slice of the pie that we could call our own, because that's our king, that's our little kingdom, that's our, <coughs> excuse me, our castle. And they want to turn it into this, which is high density urban dwelling or mixed use dwellings. Now, there's nothing in the world wrong with this. Nothing. They're fine. I've seen some of these. I've got nine foot ceilings, granite countertops, you know, great big kitchens. I mean, they're beautiful. Absolutely stunning. There's nothing wrong with it if you want it. There's everything wrong with it if you find it. In fact, all that is is a plan to get to this. 
So unfortunately, when you walk out of here tonight, you're going to have to think about this stuff. You're going to have to ask lots and lots of questions to find out where are we going with this thing? Is this just part of this? Or is this something different? So, in order to make all this function, in order to make this a reality, we needed two systems. One was smart growth. Smart growth essentially manages people in urban development, and the Wildlands Project manages the rural land. Between the two of them, they drive people off of the rural lands into the urban areas and get people out of automobiles and into bicycles and walking. That's where this walkable community all comes from. It's not just the nice idea that walking is good exercise. It's also the fact that we're trying to, we have another agenda here. And we're trying to fulfill this and see that this becomes a reality. So how did this now get to my backyard? We've gotten it down into every community in the United States. So how do I now take this idea that the President's Council on Sustainable Development put over here and get it into, I don't know, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, or Lehighton, or wherever it might be? Well, actually, that's relatively simple. Money. All we did was we allocated money from the President's Council on Sustainable Development, and we gave it to different agencies. One was HUD. HUD then contracted with groups like the American Planning Association. The American Planning Association is not the only planning association in America, but it's, it's the gorilla on the block. It's the biggest one. They have 100,000 members. They have 11,000 uh, designated planners around the United States. And essentially, all they did was they put together a boilerplate program that implemented Sustainable America throughout the United States of America. And this is what the boilerplate program looks like. So when a planner comes into your area, and he's from the American Planning Association, or she is from American Planning Association, this is where all that fancy planning comes from. You think you're going to visioning meetings and you're coming up with this really neat idea that's just meant for our community. And while there may be a few little modifications here or there, essentially these are all boilerplate. No matter what the plan is, no matter what community you live in, they're all the same as if it's part of the sustainable development program. But one of these wasn't enough. Can you still see the screen right there? Okay. So one of these wasn't enough. So we came out with two of them. So this is the second. So it's 1,500 pages of boilerplate. So it doesn't matter where you live, whether you live in Tucson, Arizona, whether you live in Syracuse, New York, whether you live in Santa Cruz, New Mexico, or whether you live in Stockholm, Sweden, <coughs> the plans are essentially all identical. They're all based on what came out of here, which is driven by what came out of here. In addition to these planning organizations implementing Agenda 21 throughout various communities, by the way, Agenda 21 is in every county in the United States of America. If you doubt me, then just plug in sustainable development, social equity, let's, let's separate this, sustainable development, the kind you and I think of, which is healthy, from social, social equity, the UN thing, and your county, and see what pops up. You're going to find it in there. Also, the, the Worldwide Nature, uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature, the uh, World Resources Institute, International Union for Conservation and Nature, these all fund and provide grants and provide uh, documentation and direction to implement a sustainable development agenda, 20, the Agenda 21 version of it. These guys you may never have heard of. They are some of the largest NGOs in the world. In many cases, they have millions of members. They have the clout of small nations. And here's why. When a treaty is put together, these are the people with the money to do the due diligence and the background work to put those treaties together. So they'll actually provide the documentation to an emerging country or even, an, even, even a fully developed nation, and that will become the basis for a full-blown treaty later on. It starts out as a soft treaty and becomes a full-blown treaty. So you probably may not have heard of these folks, but you have heard of these folks. The Sierra Club, Audubon Society, Nature Conservancy, National Wildlife Federation, Part of the bylaws and regulations that they function by are in, in direct compliance with what comes out of Agenda 21. Now, let me just, you know, time out. I'm not saying that everything the Sierra Club ever did was bad. It's not. They do a lot of good stuff. I'm not saying everything the Audubon Society did was bad. They do a lot of good stuff. In the same way with the National Wildlife and Nature Conservancy. They do a lot of good things to help our planet and to help our nation. But they're also doing some things that are going to implement this. So again, we've got to make those distinctions when we're sitting down with our local planners or we're attending our local planning meetings. 
ICLE is one of those non-governmental organizations that we just talked that we just talked about. They don't belong to the United Nations, but they do work in concert with them, and often at the auspices of them. Their job was to roll out Agenda 21. We have the documentation for those actual meetings between the United Nations and the officers running ICLE, and they said, this is your job. We want you guys, since you've done such a good job so far, to take, to take the wheel and uh, roll out Agenda 21. And so they do. They push local communities to regulate the environment. They guide visioning meetings with stakeholders. We're going to show you what some of these visioning meetings look like, and they're not what you might think they are. Gain elected official buy-in via grants and intimidation. The quickest way that I can take your property rights away is to waive grant money in Frank. And those property rights just go up like they evaporate. Minimize protests, implement and enforce sustainable development. Uh, ICLE right now operates in over 300, uh, I'm sorry, over 600 counties in the United States. And I'm not going to wait for all these to scroll forward ahead. Their goal is to operate in uh, six, in 1,000 communities. I think it's by Mushroom, 2014, 2015. They want to be in 1,000 different communities. Uh, and they are gaining ground in some areas, but they're also losing ground in other areas. And we're going to describe exactly where that is. Uh, th this just scrolls and goes on and on and on and on. And uh, I just want to give you some kind of an idea of the impact that this group ICLE has here in the United States of America. So when somebody says ICLE is not part of the UN, uh, <laughs> excuse me, but they are part of the, they're not part of the UN, but they've been authorized by the United Nations to win all these communities to implement the Agenda 21 program we were just talking about. Uh, now, in June of this year, Executive Order 13575 was signed by our President. And Executive Order 13575 said, that it granted the federal government authority over the food, fiber, and energy for 16% of the United States of America. It provided 25 governmental agencies the power and leverage to leverage federal investments in rural areas to increase the impact of federal dollars and create the economic opportunities to improve the quality of life in rural America. Doesn't that sound great? Let's start to look at what I just said. I just said, I'm now in charge of food, fiber, and energy for 16% of the United States of America in one office, the Office of the Presidency, because all these federal agencies report up to the Presidency. Mm -hmm. I just provided all this power to 25 government agencies. Go to Wikipedia, there aren't 25 federal agencies. There's only 24. So where's the 25th one? How do we do that one? That was interesting. It was a wild card that the President threw in. In case we ever do have another agency, mm -hmm. you, we're covered. So we know that these guys are going to be in there, and they'll be, they'll be able to uh, have all this power. Power to do what, though? To leverage federal investments. What is a federal investment? Reach in your pocket. <coughs> Reach in your wallet. Check your checking account. That's what a federal investment is. It's your money. They're investing your money. But hopefully it's for the good of society, so maybe nah, it all, all rolls out. It's okay, right? Well, let's see. They're going to invest our money in rural areas to increase the impact of federal dollars to create economic opportunities. How do you increase the impact of federal dollars? There's only one way to do it. How do I increase the impact of federal money? I increase impact by writing laws. I create more regulations, more restrictions, more limitations. And those regulations then enhance the impact that I have in the organization. It's real easy. And how hard is it for a federal agency to create a new regulation? Anything to it? Nothing to it at all. I said, no, in fact, I have a friend of mine who works for the, as a scientist, works with the Department of Environmental Protection, and they say that it's almost a joke when comments come in to the website. Because you can go to the website where this federal, uh, when new federal regulations come. It's a joke. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people called in when health care came out because they, they put it up when some, one passed some of these regulations, they put it up on the, uh, on the uh, agency website. And they don't even pay attention. And they joke about them in the back room. And at the end of the day, these agencies do pretty much precisely what they want. And unless it gets real high profile and there's a lot of pushback, then you might be able to get somewhere with it. So that's what's happening to our federal dollars. So this leveraging that's taking place, here's where it took place. And by the way, this is all in Executive Order 13575. So you can go on, Google it, download it, take a look at it. Executive Order 13575. We impact uh, engagement, uh, in, improve and leverage our engagement with agricultural organizations, small businesses, educational institutions, healthcare providers, telecommunication services, healthcare providers, research institutions, healthcare providers, 
health care providers. What does health care providers have to do with sustainable development? Well, if you read Agenda 21, it says in here, every person on Earth must be covered with health insurance. Now, am I saying that, that the uh, Affordable Care Act that President Obama passed uh, last year was part of Agenda 21? No, I'm not, because I don't know if he did it with this in mind or not. I can't get inside the guy's head. I don't know. All I know is it certainly works in concert with it, so it worked out rather well. Uh, if he did it or not is, is anybody's guess. But the reality is, health care was already written into Agenda 21 and already be signed on by the United States. Law enforcement, state government agencies, local government agencies, all subject to leveraging by the federal government, which essentially gives the federal government power over food production, land use, and a de facto cap and trade program for 16% of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That's what Executive Order 13575 does for you and I. You remember when the president went on this rural White House, uh, I'm sorry, rural communities tour a while ago when he had those two buses? About a million bucks a pop or something like that? Okay. That was paid for under the White House Rural Communities Act. That was why it was called the White House Rural Bus Tour, because this, this is the group that paid for it. The buses were made, anybody remember where they were made? Canada. Canada. The buses, now, did, did, full disclosure, they weren't completely made in Canada. Some of the parts were actually made here in the United States. But the bulk of the money went off to Canada. Now, we do that right here in Pennsylvania, I understand. We can, we can put those buses together and not a fine job here. Why in the world would you transfer jobs and money out of the United States unless you were trying to distribute wealth to different nations? Right. Why would I tie up all my resources here in the United States? We have. I remember from when I was in geography class when I went to school about 122 years ago, I think it was when I graduated. They used to talk about the United States being fantastic because they had all these, these natural resources that made us such a powerhouse of the nation. Well, all of a sudden, we can't get to these resources. And we've discovered new energy resources, and we can't get near those either. But we will give loan guarantees to Brazil so they can go out and build the same high of a deep water rig that we're concerned about and then sink the thing into in the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico and begin drilling for oil there with our money guaranteeing the loans to make that happen. And then go to that country and say, we want to be your best customer. See how the money goes? OK, maybe that's not what it's all about. But it sure, it sure does fit the formula. Uh, 19 days after that executive order was, sound, was uh, signed by the president, uh, leading figures from the Obama administration, cabinet agencies, U.S. Congress, major corporations, nonprofits, and civil society organizations all met in New York with members of ICLE. ICLE's job, according to the UN, was to roll out Agenda 21. So they all had a nice lunch, I guess, after they signed off on the deal. Now, here's what you need to be concerned about on a local level is how this stuff gets into my community. And again, I want to differentiate again. I'm not saying that every ounce of planning that takes place in the country is bad planning. I'm not. I have a very dear friend who put together a program for 10 different communities. And she did a wonderful job. And they have uh, open spaces there. They've got certain historic preservations on some buildings. They have water issues that they cleared up. Uh, and they're now uh, a sustainable food year 2030. Nobody lost anything. They got a little bit of grant money, but they made darn sure there were no strings attached to that grant money. So I'm not saying that you can't have planning and have good planning. I'm saying that you've got to be uh, vigilant. Now, <clears throat> what'll happen is, in this Agenda 21 version of sustainable development, which is all over the place, a planner or a group member from NICLA or NGO or maybe from the American Planning Association will approach certain stakeholders in your community. And a stakeholder is not necessarily somebody who lives in the community. It's a like-minded individual who agrees with what the planner wants. <clears throat> and they come in with a crisis. It's always a crisis. And generally the crisis is overpopulation, overcrowding, water challenges, too much farmland, too little farmland. You're not going to be able to supply the food for the people in the area. There's like four or five key crises. And when these guys come in, they are always the same. We've got one community that we're working with that came in. this up in Massachusetts. And they said, well, we've got an overpopulation problem, and if this thing keeps going the way it is, you know, by the year 2030, you're going to have, you know, exploding here. Therefore, we've got to, to, to begin to re, re-divide the property here and change the way your, your standard, your uh, living is going. Well, the only problem was the population up there has been shrinking. People are moving away, not into the, uh, from that county, not into the county. There's absolutely nothing to base this on. I've got another county in New Jersey we went down to that there's this transportation report that was done. 
And based on the transportation report, all kinds of plans are being rolled out that this county has to do. And some are done. They're all the same. Mixed-use dwellings, walkable, walkable communities, uh, bike paths, open spaces. Everything is exactly identical to what's in these booklets over here. The only problem is it's all based on a transportation plan that nobody can get their hands on. Now, the state's supposed to release in New Jersey. They're supposed to release these. The law says you have to have access to these. So we're trying to get them, but we are fighting a heck of a fight to get a hold to see where this documentation came from. Again, I'm not saying all documentation is bad. It's not. I'm not saying all surveys are bad. It's not. I'm saying there aren't certain places that are becoming overpopulated. There are. But you need to do your homework and differentiate. Well, once they come into a community with this so-called crisis, and they meet with the stakeholders, they will then send out a survey. And I'm going to show you what these surveys look like. The survey is a stacked deck. You can't win with this thing. Then the stakeholders are invited to a visioning meeting, and finally they begin to implement the program. So let's back up here. I have stakeholders coming in, so let's take a look at what that looks like. I start with a survey. I don't know if you can see that up there or not. This is from uh, Carver, uh, Massachusetts. And this survey went on for about 20 pages with a bunch of questions. But every one of the questions was loaded. For instance, number one. How important is the rural character of Carver? Well, what are you going to say? It's not. I don't care about the rural character of Carver. So you're going to say, well, yeah, sure. Or number two, which of the following do you feel, and we're talking about farmland, land for outdoor use, areas of historical worth, areas for passive outdoor recreation. Essentially, if you read A through M, I just took up your whole community. There's nothing left. So which of these following do you feel should be protected or acquired? I'm giving you a big choice here. Do you want me to protect your land or do you want me to take it away from you? Which would you like? I'll be more than happy to do either one. So these things are a stacked deck that you can't win. If you ignore the thing and you throw it away, then you're not part of the process. If you fill it out, more than likely you're providing a lot, some, or a little of impetus to move the program forward. And the program is always the one that's designed by the vision, the, the planners that come into your organization. And then, of course, when you get done, out come these great-looking graphs that end up popping up in the local newspaper. And, oh, you know, in this case, 79% want access to rivers and ponds. Well, that might be right for your backyard, but hey, 79% of the community says they want it. Farmland and agricultural land, 68.48%. What's a little conservation easement? Conservation easements are fine, as long as you understand what the downside is. <coughs> the guy who owns the conservation easement can take over your property, and then the conservation easement goes away, and he's got the whole thing in his hand. Also, third parties can come in with as a conservation easement, and they get to review that from time to time and report back. And there's always money to buy out your property to reduce value once you grab that two or three or four hundred thousand bucks up front that you thought so handy. So we, we need to understand all sides of these things. Areas for outdoor education, 61.41%. <clears throat> well, in this survey, you notice 318 people responded. So this entire program being put together for car up here is based on these 318 people, what they had to say. But how many people live in car? Anybody see that one? Mm -hmm. 9,000. Over 9,000 people live there. 300 responded. You're talking decisions being made by 3% of the people who are actually involved in this program. Now, 3% is of, of the population is fine if you're doing a poll to see who's going to be president next time out. But it's not all right when you talk about taking away people's property and they have no idea whether they're in the game, they're out of the game, whether it's something they want or perhaps don't want. And this isn't unusual. It's more commonplace. We're going to jump over here to Copaig, which is a lovely little town on the south shore of Long Island. And we're going to discuss the visioning process. Now, visioning processes the world over are the same. I'm in business. Uh, is there anybody called a visioning session in your business? <coughs> you ever done? Yeah, you planning and visioning. And the rules for planning or basically the provisioning are all the same. Uh, everybody gets a voice. Don't talk over your partner over there. You want to hear what everyone has to say. There are no bad ideas. We just want to hear whatever ideas you have to offer. So that's kind of how the visioning goals go. Okay, but not this time now. Take a look at the visioning goals here. Ensure community participation and voice. That's just dandy. That's fine. Revitalize downtown as a mixed-use transit-oriented district. Excuse me. Is that a goal, or is that the end result? This isn't part of the visioning process. These are people that came to the table with exactly what they wanted done, because they took this information off of one of the surveys that they did. So the survey, and wait till you see how many people were in the survey, 
decided that we want to explore redevelopment potential for industrial areas around the train station, strengthen economic opportunities in the downtown area. We're no longer going along with the will of the people. We're now completely in bed with the will of the planners who decided what to do. And here's where this stuff came from, so we understand. The most important partner in this process is you. And that's as it should be. And I love the way they put you. Big capital letters are you. You are the most important person here. So who participated in this process? Who participated? Over 300 people participated throughout this whole process. Well, that's pretty good. I don't know, there's maybe 50 people or so in this room, so 300 would be a huge room. So 300 people participating, that's, that's pretty darn good. <coughs> uh, this was a healthy mix of people who live in the study area and those that use it for other purposes, but live in surrounding communities. So what am I saying? Those 300 people didn't even call from, all come from Kobe. They come from the surrounding communities. But hey, that's all right. They get a little bit of a say, I guess, right? Even though it's not their property, they have something to say about it. The problem is, do you know how many people live in Kobe, Long Island? I just woke this up. 18, you're close. 18,000 people left there. Now, my math isn't all that great, but if there's 18,000 people and 300 people participated, you're talking about maybe 1.5% of the total population was involved in what took place down here. So people are not engaged. Now, whose fault is that? Is that the planner's fault? Is it the individual's fault? I don't know. We, we have to take it upon ourselves to become more involved in the things that are taking place. But this plan down here, very few people were ever involved in it, though ultimately when it's done, it affects virtually everyone. Now, there are certain things we need to look out for when we go into these books and when planners come into your community. And one is called the precautionary principle. Now, let me explain what the precautionary principle is. It's pretty much standard in most planning. It says that where threats of serious or irreversible harm to people or nature exist, anticipatory action will be taken to prevent damages to human and environmental health, even when full scientific certainty about cause and effect is not available, with, with the intent of safeguarding the quality of life for current and future generations. I don't need to be able to prove to you that there's a problem. I just have to be able to suspect that there's one, and that gives me the authority to begin to redesign your, your, your locality's master plan, and if I can't do that, I'll go and I get the regulations changed in the organization uh, throughout, your, uh, throughout your community, and I'll get around it that way. Now, let's look at this precautionary principle a little more, because this is how those farmers, uh, those, I'm sorry, those people I just mentioned down in Dade County, Florida, all those people looking for their, their land back, this is how they lost it. Now, if you go to this paper that you have, the UN paper that you have, and go to principle number 15, it's on the second page near the bottom. In order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach should be widely applied by states according to their capabilities. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. What happened in Dade, Miami County, Florida, in that area that I showed in the very beginning, was the local Department of Environmental Management came in and said, this is a wetland, and therefore you guys are going to have to move, we'll give you a certain amount of money for it, and they offered like 30 cents on the dollar. The people didn't have, you know, didn't want to do 30 cents on the dollar, so they called in the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers said, there's no wetland here. You have no problem at all. There's absolutely no scientific proof that this is a wetland. So what happened? Durham went out and they pulled out the precautionary principle. And they said, we don't have to be able to prove it. That is happening throughout the United States of America. It's not happening everywhere. It's not happening in every community. It's not every single plan. But it's out there enough that you need to understand what's happening to protect your own rights. Fishing from North Carolina to the Keys is, has some of the best red snapper fishing anywhere. In fact, there's a joke among local fishermen. There's so many red snappers out there, you dive in the water and they catch you. 70% <laughs> of our fleet is at dry dock down there. Why? Because the EPA won't allow them to fish there. Why? Because they said that there's a shortage based on not science, not numbers, but precautionary principle and consensus among, the, among certain parties, uh, certain environmental groups. Consensus, that's going to pop up again too. Well, if you think a precautionary principle is troubling, where do you see the amortization of non-conforming uses? The amortization of non-conforming uses is in chapter 8 of uh, whatever volume 2 is here, of those two books. The whole chapter on it. Here's how amortization of non-conforming uses works. If you think you can't lose your property, if you think, well, I have nothing to worry about because, you know, my community is protected from all this stuff, no worries. 
Try this. But for homeowners who live in a community that adopts the guidebook's vision, that's the guidebook they're talking about. Some growing smart legislative guidebook. The APA, American Planning Association, amortization proposal means the extinguishing over time of their right to occupy their houses and without just compensation for loss of that property. How long they have been there before they must forfeit their homes will be completely up to the local government. When you sign on to these programs, this is the deal that you're signing on for. Now, that there are ways to get out of this, so I'll explain some of this. But you have to understand, this is real. Now, that's like a Chinese menu. Remember I said these were templates? So it doesn't mean that everything that's in here is bad. It doesn't mean that everything in here is going to be in your community. It's not. It doesn't mean that every planner is necessarily using this book. Most of them do, but not necessarily all of them. So you might say, well, look, i got a sharp town council. <clears throat> They're going to take one look at the amortization of non-conforming uses and say, get that out of here. We're not going to do that. Well, I'm going to show you that it won't matter. You'll get stuck with it anyway. And here's how. All I have to do is create a regional board. And then they roll your plan up into the regional plan. And then whatever the regional plan has to say, you're stuck with it. So you think you had all these local protections? They just went out the window. But of course, you have to approve that first, right? Well, let me show you how that works. This is downloadable. You can get a policy framework for adopting the precautionary principle, January 2004, Washington State. Took it right off the internet. This was approved in 2004. And here's what they did. The local community decided that they didn't want to go along with these land grants, so they voted against it. So here's what the planners did. I'm going to, this, this, you're going to watch this thing roll up so fast you're not even going to notice. It's like a worm slipping into a mud bag. So I'm going to let you know when we come up with the good sentence. Individual policies in Washington State, King County, and the city of Seattle include aspects of the precautionary principle. Precautionary principle came out of here, remember? That was in here. That's what we were reading. Well, now it's in here. And now it's in a planning uh, program for uh, Washington State here. Here's the sentence. However, adopting our recommended amendment within city and community comprehensive plans would provide a more comprehensive and unified approach to decision making in local government, an approach which is based on the values held by Seattle and King County and recognize the importance of all communities. That was it. That's the sentence that did it. They signed on to this, and all of a sudden, 17,000 people didn't know what hit them. That's why those people were in that picture, in that uh, news clipping that I had, marching down the county clerk's office with petitions, which were not successful in trying to get their property back again. That's the precautionary. That's the, that's the amortization of non-conforming uses. Again, does that mean that all regional groups are not good? No, it doesn't. I have a very dear friend of mine who has a regional group up in Pennsylvania, not far from here. He's a wonderful guy. He would never want something like this to happen. But it does mean that as citizens, we have to be alert to what's going on around us. This is the 17,000 people. The ordinance 15053 created the 6510 rule. And what the 6510 rule said was on 65% of your property, if you own five acres of land or more, you could not build, you could not do anything other than leave that land in its natural vegetative state. So what happens to my property if I give up 65% of it to somebody else? I don't own it anymore. Let's suppose my son or my daughter comes to me and says, hey, Dad, things are going kind of rough right now financially. Could we move in with you? To which I would say, well, no, but <laughs> I've got three, I have a couple extra acres in the back. Why don't you take one of those and we'll put a house up there for you. We'll find a nice builder and, and you'll be off and running until you get your feet on the ground. And then I'll have another piece of another building. building. So, you know, I'm building my own little small empire here. Well, they're saying, no, you don't get to do any of that stuff. Suppose I want to put a swing set back there for my grandchildren when they come over, a swimming pool. I don't get to do that. And the 10% means that 10% of their land can only have the pervious structures on it, the, the driveway, the building, and so on and so forth. That's all I can actually build on. These people didn't realize this is what was happening to the property. And that's why they were screaming. Now, their property values are starting to drop. In some cases, they've gone up. Full disclosure, some of them have actually gone up. Others have gone down. But over time, what happens is they tend to go up, and then they begin to drop, and they tend to drop down, because those urban areas across the way are where all the building is going on, and that's where all the money is being made, and that's where all the value is, is, uh, is being extended. Uh, and that comes from, from uh, trading off of development rights. There's several ways that properties are, are confiscated through this scheme. One of them is through conservation easements or trading and development rights. A conservation easement, very often, is we'll, a whole group will go into a farmland and say, well, you know, we've done surveys here, and we find that it's cheaper to have farmland 
because you don't have to have all those support, the community support and utilities and so on out there. So all those community services aren't necessary. So it's, it's a lot cheaper to have farms, and you're able to raise fresh fruits and vegetables and you can feed the community. So you don't want to have builders coming in here. So here's what we'll do. We're going to buy up your, prop, your development rights on your property. And we're going to establish that we'll give you all this money. You may have a property that's worth $2 million, $3 million. Uh, we're just, of the, all the rights that you have, we're just going to take this one little one, the development rights away, and tell you what you have to do with that. And in turn, we'll give you, I don't know, half a million dollars. So the guy's saying, wow, this is right. Great, but you get to keep the property. Now, here's what the guy just did that he doesn't realize. He does get to keep the property. And he does have a half a million in his pocket, which is you know, nothing to, nothing to uh, complain about. So it all looks good. But what happens is he has now these best practices that are put in place by federal agencies. And the best practices keep getting ratcheted up and up and up. And pretty soon, it's no longer profitable to farm that little piece of land. So now what do you do? Well, now I go to the guy who sold me the land, and I say, well, you know, I can't afford to do this any longer. Maybe you can help me out. Sure, I'll be happy to buy the land from you. So they buy the land from you at a reduced sale value, and once they buy the land, guess what? The conservation easement disappears, because you can't own the land and have a conservation easement at the same time. Now they can do with it whatever they want. And yes, this is happening across the United States in different communities. In Kings County, uh, uh, Washington, 141,000 acres was lost of homeowners. Homeowners' development rights were lost on 141,000 acres. 2,400 potential dwelling units were moved into urban areas. When you get involved with these community programs through this Agenda 21 program, everything is predetermined. You think your vision is yours. You think these ideas are yours. You think there's a consensus <clears throat> among the community. But in fact, that consensus, consensus has already been predetermined. Uh, over in New Jersey, this has gone, a, a great example of this is a, a group called Sustainable New Jersey. Now, we've met with these people, and they've sworn up and down, we have nothing to do with UN Agenda 21. We have nothing to do with, with the sustainable development that you're talking about. Now, we're, we're pure, is the term they love to use. Except that, if you look down here, oops, sorry. Look down here, I hope you can see it from there. Their program encompasses the three equal interrelated components of sustainability. Prosperity, which is economic prosperity. Planet practice, which was the environment. And uh, people uh, embrace social equity. So equity, environment, and the economy. The three E's are right there in their program. That's Sustainable Jersey. But it doesn't just stop there. Sustainable Jersey in practically every town over in New Jersey. If you go to a little Denville, uh, little town of Denville, in the township of Denville in New Jersey, you go on their website and what do you, what do you see? That first line right there, I don't know if you can make it out or not. The township of Denville has been certified as a sustainable community by Sustainable New Jersey. And what is sustainable development? Well, right there it is. Social equity, uh, environment, and the economy, exactly as we took it out of the, uh, uh, exactly as we took it out, thank you, exactly as we took it out of the uh, uh, original report for the UN. The UN 3Es are now in every single state in the United States of America. What's sustainable development? Go to the township of uh, uh, Denville, and again we see meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs is one of the most popularly defined definitions of sustainability. It takes its root in the 1987 United Nations Problem Commission. Yes, these are all interrelated. Yes, these communities are involved in Agenda 21. Uh, Dade County, Florida, we talked about the 1,500 people. They, you might say, well, why do they go to court to try to help themselves? Well, they can't go to court because, remember this guy's picture? Remember we saw Harvey? He was the guy that said in, in developing sustainable development, the uh, needs of the individual are going to have to take a back seat to the needs of the collective. That was Harvey. Well, he's also the clerk of the court. So there's no way these people in Dade County, Florida are going to get any relief by going through the legal system. He also sits on the uh, advisory board to the ICLA. This is also influencing our children. Now we're gonna, we got to, oh, we 15 minutes to wrap this up. Influencing our children. Uh, the goal of the United Nations, a decade for a stand, uh, of education for sustainable development, for which UNESCO is the lead agency, is to integrate the principles, values, and practices of sustainable development in all aspects of education and learning. Now understand what we said here. Sustainable development, the Agenda 21 version, has made its way into our communities in two methods. One is through development and through planning in the local community, and the other is through the education system. 
if we can change the minds of children and get them to think more placidly, to think and get them to go along with things, it would be an awful lot easier to implement this stuff which is anti-rights. So, the educational effort will encourage changes in behavior that create a more sustainable future. Now, how many people in this room sent your children to school to have their, have their behavior changed? Any of them? I don't think so. I wanted to learn the three R's, read and write and arithmetic. But instead, we're talking about changing people's behavior. That's exactly what these programs do. The UN Decade of, sustain of Education for Sustainable Development, which is right here, this is the over uh, overview of the uh, program, is nothing but the 40 chapters of Agenda 21 put in a classroom training program and approved by the Department of Education and the National Education Association for use in the United States. Mm -hmm. Children are being taught that facts are man-made. And I'll show you where they're man-made. They're being taught about eliminating of disagreement, to rely on experts, and to only okay, it's only okay to question certain ideas. Now the reason we're in this room tonight is because we're questioning things. You may agree with me, you may not agree with me, that's fine. You get to question me. I get to question the status quo. You get to question the status quo. That's what the part of America is about. But all of a sudden, certain things are not open to question. And this came out of this book, by the way, so you know where I got it. Wealth is socially unjust. So if some guy over here makes a half a million a year, and some guy over here makes 50,000 a year, that's not fair. That's what your children are being taught. Wealth is destroying the environment. Man is causing global warming. That's up in the air right now. The whole thing about global warming is kind of very highly suspect. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's looking iffy. Uh, women and girls are marginalized. Well, at a certain time, they were more marginalized than they are today. So I, again, wouldn't you want to at least be able to question that? I know some very successful women who are doing really, really well for themselves. So I'm not, I don't know. I want to be able to question these things. Your kids are being taught not to question it. I'm going to show you how. One way is through a program called Connected Math. This is the Connected Math guidebook. This book is used throughout the United States of America. It's not in every single classroom. It's, it's, for, it's for grades uh, 6 through 8 that this teaches mathematics. It uses what they call a standards-based principle, which means we have certain standards, but we don't teach facts. In fact, because this curriculum does not emphasize the arithmetic computation done by hand, some connected math project students may not do well on tests assessing computational skills. In other words, I'm going to go through math and I don't know how to compute? Well, that's what they're being taught. And that comes right out of the teacher's manual. We believe such a trade-off in favor of CMP is very much to the student's advantage in the world of work. But if you think that's troubling, read what's on page 17. Standard 3. I'll take it right out of the book. Page 17. Through dis discussing problems and their solutions, students learn to reason. They learn that, man is, that mathematics is man-made, that it is arbitrary, and good solutions are arrived at by consensus among those who are considered expert. So we no longer can just say that, hey, 3 times 3 is, well, we don't know. Because it's a consensus. Your children are being taught consensus. More and more through society, you're going to hear this term consensus pop up. Have you heard about the idea that there's a consensus that there's man-made global warming? Yes. Um, there is no such thing in science. As I said, my friend is a scientist. They don't do consensus. They do facts. And you either prove them or you disprove them. And if you prove them, then you go on to become a, a hypothesis. And if that sticks, then it becomes a theory one day. Did you ever hear of the hypothesis of anthropogenic global warming? There was no such thing. It just became a theory overnight. And suddenly it had the same status as a theory of relativity. How did that happen? It happened through the notion that consensus was okay and we put it everywhere. And that's what your children are being taught in school. Consensus. Math is arbitrary. Now there are people fighting back trying to get this out of the school system. In Texas they got it out of a few of the school districts. But there's a lot of controversy over this. There are reports out that say that this is, quote, an exemplary system. Guess where they come from? It's part of education. <laughs> that's who says it's an exemplary system. And the way they get it into the school system is through grants. They give grant money for training, and schools suck up the grant money, and they're stuck with the program. Influencing our children. Now, you might think that all this is just a bad mistake, like new math, and maybe we're just, you know, we tried to teach our kids the right thing, so we, we did a good job, but we kind of messed up. Well, I'm going to show you that that's not the case at all. What you're seeing here is intentional. And I got this right out of here. Education for Sustainable Development Toolkit, written by Rosalind McEwen. She's one of those experts. And here's what Rosalind had to say. Generally, more highly educated people who have higher incomes 
consume more resources than poorly educated people who tend to have lower incomes. In this case, more education increases the threat to sustainability. You get the connection? You think this is an accident? It's not. Nobody spends, to the best of my knowledge, spends more money on education than we do per child in the United States of America. And yet our grades keep dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And part of the reason is because of exactly what you see in this book. If the kids are highly educated, they consume more, and that's going to be bad for the planet. Therefore, we only want them to know so much, and consensus is easy. If I get a kid that's been drilled consensus in his head, then he becomes very compliant. Communities are pushing back. Carroll County, Maryland had an Office of Sustainability. They dissolved the thing. Las Cruces, New Mexico, Carver, Massachusetts, all of these are towns. If the state of Florida just outlawed smart growth throughout the whole state. That didn't start all, well, stop all development, but it, 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 it woke a lot of people up. Virginia is pushing back. Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, Carroll County, Maryland, Maryland, we just mentioned. Edmonds, Oklahoma dropped out of Ickley. Montgomery County, Pennsylvania dropped out. Oklahoma City dropped out. Uh, 14 communities across the country now have dropped out of this equally program. So we've had enough of it. I'm on a time now. Uh, the Wisconsin legislature introduced bills enabling local governments to repeal comprehensive plans. What I'm saying is not mystical, it's not tinfoil hat, it's not imaginary, it's not some conspiracy thing. This is happening. Two bills have passed in are, are in the legislature right now to try to return property rights back that have, that have come in when community planners come in and alter those master plans so that people win their property back again. And in Bonner County, Idaho, um, we're working very closely with the people out there. They've established a property rights council to protect private property rights from governmental activity. Governments are coming, bypassing your local community, bypassing your local town laws, bypassing your local ordinances, and money is coming right down from HUD. And when you accept that HUD money, there's a 66-page document under no fund. Notice of funds. It is now 8:35, and the library will close promptly at 9 p.m. Go to page 11 in that document, and it will tell you exactly what your community is going to look like, whether you want it or not, if you took that money. And here's what you can do: uh, learn more, Google the stuff that I put up here. I want you to check out open spaces. When people say it's overpopulated, find out why. Ask for definitions of social and economic justice. Uh, write out what your concerns are. Get them to your town. Check with your representatives, find out their names, and educate those people. Uh, demand political candidates take a stand on this sustainable development stuff, this version of sustainable development. Remember, we're not against sustainable development. We're against this version of it. Recruit your neighbors and your friends to get involved. And in conclusion, our local communities are now in peril because a small group seeks to convince us that unless we surrender our property and our freedoms, unless we subsume our individual rights to the good of the community, the planet will not survive. Yet this is a false choice. For over 200 years, Americans have protected our planet, our nation, and our liberties. As communities, we can pull together to create our own plans to improve the government, the environment, without the control of international groups and the seductive lure of easy federal grants. Working together, we can save our environment and keep our rights and freedoms. That is the real choice. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. tonight, and it also goes by another name, sustainable development. You'll find that these two terms are used interchangeably. So we're going to trace the very history of it. So to understand the documents, you have to understand the people who put those documents together. So two people are, are primarily responsible for this. In 1980, uh, 1986, the United Nations requested a report be done. Actually, 1982, they requested the report. It was finally completed in 87. They requested a report that said, what can we do to protect our planet against things like global warming, against the misuse of our, our uh, natural resources, uh, and also to eliminate poverty. So they asked Gro Brundtland if she would head up a commission and write this report. So you have to understand, let's understand a little bit about Gro Brundtland. Gro Brundtland was the uh, Prime Minister of Norway three times in a row. She's a popular gal. Gro is also the Vice President of the World Socialist Party. Now, since most of the world is socialist anyway, that's not so hard to believe. That makes sense. But what we might understand is what Gro believes. If you go onto the website of the World Socialist Party here in the United States, our chapter of it, here's what it says. The World Socialist Party of the United States is part of a globalist socialist movement that believes capitalism cannot meet the needs of the majority of people in the world, however progressive it might become. To meet these needs, capitalism must be replaced by socialism. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with this if that's what you believe in, but you, you need to understand. If you're going to understand where Agenda 21 came from and how this whole piece came to be put together, you need to understand the people who wrote the documents that created it. This gal thinks we need to get rid of capitalism, so that's one of her main objectives. We also have another gentleman I'd like to introduce you to named Maurice Strong. Now, Maurice uh, is kind of an interesting guy. He was the former director of the uh, UN Environmental Program. He's also the chairman of the World Wildlife Foundation. Now, Maurice, Maurice is a cool guy to get to know. Maurice, by the time he was 25 years old, was a... What you're going to see tonight is something that should be able to bring all of us together. Because we're not going to point out to some bad guy. You're going to see some pretty awful things that are taking place here. And you're going to want to blame somebody. You're going to say, well, he did it, or she did it, or they did it. Very often, the people that are involved in what's going on, what you're about to see, have no idea that they're even involved. And they're doing it just in the name of trying to do a good job. Mm -hmm. So we're going to show you that, show you how it works out. We're going to start with a program called False Choices, How Agenda 21 is Transforming Your Community. Now, this woman you see here, Betty Perry, was arrested in 2007 in uh, Orem, Utah. I don't know if you can notice it up there. She's got this little mark on her nose. And that's where the handcuffs hit her when she was taken away in a police car uh, in a place in a holding tank. Now, the reason she was arrested was because her front lawn was, quote, dying. <coughs> She didn't realize that that was an offense that could result in her going off to jail. In the earlier part of this year, 2011, Julie Bass was planting an organic garden in her front yard. Simple thing to do. Julie likes organic foods for her family. So uh, they became quite expensive, so she decided, gee, I'll just start a little garden for myself. Seems interesting and innocent enough. However, she checked with the mayor first to be sure that was okay in their town. And the mayor said, well, that's fine. You can go ahead and plant a garden. We don't have a problem with that at all. She went to the town council, and they said, we don't care. That's fine. Plant your garden. Next thing you know, an enforcement code officer pulls up, and she's being hauled away and now faces 93 days in jail. What happened? The technology officer, officer from town came in and said, that's not allowed under these new uh, uh, zoning ordinances that we've established through our uh, master plan. And therefore, you now face uh, charges. She's now fighting those criminal charges. In Dade County, uh, Florida, 1,500 people are losing their homes. And we're going to see why they're losing them and why they're having such difficulty in getting those back. And over here, 17,000 people in King County, Washington, have petitioned the county courthouse to try to win back their land rights because they've lost 65% of their land. So we're going to discuss just how can these crazy things happen. I mean, this is America, and, and this stuff doesn't happen here, right? Well. In order to get into this whole scheme of understanding why this is going on and, and how it may or may not affect you, we have to understand the value of property rights. Without property rights, we don't have freedom, we don't have liberty. They are unalienable, they are not lienable, you can't place liens against those, that was the meaning of the word. But it also means it cannot be severed. Property rights cannot be taken away from us, and our founding fathers made a, a specific point of that. They even went to the Constitution, and the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution said, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall our private property be taken from the public use without just compensation. So why all this emphasis on property? Well, it's real simple. We talk about rights all the time, but as, after a while we begin to take those rights for granted, and we forget just what they actually mean to us. So let me put property rights in perspective. You and I and everyone else in this room are organic living beings. We need certain things in order to survive. We need food, we need land, we need a roof over our head. We have to at least have the ability to have that completely within our control and nobody with the ability to take it away from you. If you don't have that ability, then you're either a surf or you're on your way there. You have to at least have the opportunity to live in a nation where, you know what, I can own this and it's mine and nobody can ever get it away from me. That's why proper, our founding fathers found property rights so very important. It's something that you were given the authority, the ability, through the Constitution to own, and no one could ever take it away from you. Now that's the way we work in the United States of America. But not all countries work that way. So what I'd like to introduce you to is the United Nations Agenda 21. We're going to oil company. So um, some of the things he did were not completely on the up and up. If you try to track Maurice down today, you can probably find him because he lives in China. Anybody remember the oil for food program? Mm -hmm. And the scandal that followed that? Yeah. That was Maurice. <laughs> he was in the middle of it. So we're having a little bit of trouble tracking Maurice down these days. <laughs> but these are the players. These are the two guys who are mostly responsible for this. 
a book called Our Common Future. By 1987, that book was completed, and it outlined exactly what sustainable development would look like. In fact, there's the report. I don't want you to, oh, by the way, let me preface this. I don't want you to take my word for anything that I say this evening. Everything is documented, everything's provable. Amazon.com, you can buy this book for, I don't remember, 15, 20 bucks, you can buy the book. And if you go to chapter, to chapter two in here, it will define what sustainable development is. It is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sound familiar? I know I just heard that just a moment ago. Yeah, that was Maurice back in 1979 at the United Nations. So that kind of, you know, worked its way right in here in this book in chapter 2. It's called uh, Towards a Sustainable Development. Now, what, what this book does is it defines what mankind throughout the world, this isn't just the United States, this is every nation on earth, what mankind has to do in order to protect the planet from this new thing that was just starting, this whole global warming thing, right about then that was starting to gain popularity. Uh, to protect the planet from climate change and protect the planet from being destroyed by man. That's what this report did. So in there they said, this is what we need to do. And all this sounds good until you read the report. Because inside the report it says that poverty is a major cause and effect of global environmental problems. Well, that's kind of interesting because what I just did is I took an environmental problem and I related to a poverty problem. It's like the president of Dome Petroleum in Canada. So he was already doing fairly well for himself. He also purchased 200,000 acres of land over the largest freshwater aquifer in the United States, <laughs> along with that Nankashogi. We all remember who had Nankashogi is? Yeah. Everybody heard? He was the arms dealer that got in trouble a whole bunch of years back. But he was, he was in the newspaper, I guess, probably in the 80s. He was in there most of the time. So these two got together, bought the land up, and the idea was, what we'll do is we'll just, uh, we'll just barricade the water, and then release it to the southwestern United States, and we'll make a fortune for ourselves. We'll control all the water flow to all these farmers down there that need water. So it's like a real cool way to make money. Except the environmental groups got, the local environmental groups came in and they said, well, wait a minute, you can't do this. So they stopped him and they made him pull, pull out of there and they paid him a few million dollars to get lost. And he wasn't really very environmentally friendly. So for some bizarre reason, this guy who just got chased out by environmental groups suddenly was called upon in 1979 to become the director of the UN Environmental Program. Why? Well, I don't know. Sometimes maybe it's, maybe it's who you know and not what, what it is that you do. As the director of the UN Environmental Program, he had a mission. And I want you to listen to this mission because you're going to hear this pop up again and again and again. We're back in 1979 now to provide new leadership and encourage partnership in caring for the environment by inspiring, informing, and enabling nations and peoples to uh, improve their quality of life without compromising that of future generations. It all sounds like good stuff. I want to take care of today, have a good quality of life, and I don't want to compromise the future generations. Sound good? Absolutely. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I'm all on board with that. So we have two players here. One was a socialist who said, I need to destroy the capitalist system. The other, who made a fortune in the capitalist system, but then moved onward and decided the environmental program was, was a better way. Not exactly on the up and up all the time, dealing with arms traders, doing shady deals with land and so on, and also the head of